But even though I'm a scientist, I have a deep love for books, and our previous two panels have been all women, and now we have all men. And so I'm really looking forward to, to seeing what this panel has to say for the next hour. Um, I'd like to give a warm welcome to our friends of the book fair, who I see in our audience as well as our corporate sponsors, John and James L. Knight Foundation and American Airlines. Uh, for those of you who in your audience have books from the authors, you can get those signed after our Q&A session. Um, at the bottom of the escalator to the left-hand side, the authors will be available for autographs. And with that, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Chauncey Mabe, who will formally introduce our authors. Thank you. Hi. Well, this is definitely not a ladies panel. Um, before we get started, I want to ask, uh, I want to poll the audience. How many of you have been here all day? And how many of you came just for this panel? A great, that's a great combination. Well, for those of you who have been here all day, uh, I wouldn't exactly say we've saved the best for last, but because everything has been great, right? But you're not going to get bored with this panel. Um, you know, it's a, it's a misconception that they're either popular writers or artists. And that is well uh, illustrated by, by this panel. One thing that they have in common is they're all very serious writers, very serious craftsmen, but they also know how to tell a story and they have all achieved popular um, audiences. I'm speaking, of course, of uh, Peter Heller, Wally Cash, Ron Rash, and Garth Stein. We're going to start from uh, my right and go, go left. So um, I just got my first pair of uh, bifocals. And, um, <laughs> Peter Heller is the best-selling author of The Dog Stars. He holds an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop in both fiction and poetry. In addition, he's an award-winning adventure writer and a longtime contributor to NPR. Heller is a contributing editor at Outside Magazine, Men's Journal, and National Geographic Adventure and a regular contributor to uh, Bloomberg Businessweek. He's also the author of several nonfiction books, including Kook, The Whale Warriors, and Hail or High Water, uh, Surviving Tibet's Songpo River. His most recent book, The Painter, is the story of a man who longs to transcend the shadows in his heart, a man intent on using the losses he has suffered to create a meaningful life. Please welcome Peter Heller. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, can you guys hear me? Is this, is this, oh, okay, there we go. Uh, this is a great book fair. Um, it's awesome. I love Miami. I've never been here until yesterday. Uh, so, um, I'm going to tell you what the book's about. Uh, the book's about a painter. He's an expressionist from Taos. He's pretty famous. Uh, his paintings sell for quite a lot of money. Uh, but he's got kind of a rough streak. Uh, he's actually part of a, a school of painters that actually exists in Taos. And it was especially um, in the 70s and 80s, there was this group of really sort of rough and tumble guys who were brawlers and drinkers and really good artists. And Jim Stegner's one of those guys. He shot a guy in a bar for making a comment about his kid. Spent a year in Santa Fe State, and that's all part of the backstory. And then he suffers a tragedy, and I won't tell you what it is, but it's as bad as it gets. And then his marriage falls apart, which not so good either. And uh, he moves up to a valley in western Colorado that exists. It's the North Fork of the Gunnison and tries to put his life back together. The place is gorgeous. Uh, it's a river wind run of cottonwoods and orchards and farms. It's all surrounded by mountains. It's a very peaceful place, a good place to sort of gather peace. Uh, that's not what happens, of course. Um, Jim loves to fly fish, and it's late August. It's just before archery season. And he found a creek that he loves to fish. Oh, he finds a model 
that uh, he can work with. She's really feisty. She understands art. She went to RISD for a year, and he's starting to paint again, and he's really uh, getting back into the groove, um, selling his work again, finding some peace, and one afternoon, he's driving up the dirt road of his favorite creek to go fishing, and he can't wait to fish. It's been a few days, and there's a horse trailer blocking the road, and this outfitter, um, if you say that in Australia, they think it, it means a tailor. It's, it's not a tailor. It's a hunting guide. And he's trying to load a little strawberry roan, and the horse is balking. And this hunting guide gets frustrated, and he pulls a club out, and he starts to beat the horse to death. And Jim, um, he intervenes, and he, and he saves the horse. He kills the man, and he saves the horse. Um, he doesn't kill the guy right then, but right after. And the whole book is about what happens to his life and his work after this murder. And it's all organized around the painting. So every chapter is the catalog resume of a painting. It'll say like horse and crow, oil on linen, 20 by 30 inches, cl private collection of the artist. And so you track the story through the work, through his painting, which is kind of neat. So uh, that's what the book is about. And I thought I would just read you one short scene. It's just about four minutes long. Uh, it's, um, Jim is uh, promoting his work and a new coffee table book about him, and he goes on a radio show. Uh, uh, you guys know the Embarcadero in San Francisco? You know, down on the wharf there, and there's the ferry building. Well, they have a radio show there that um, actually is real. It's called West Coast Live, and, it, and they, every Saturday, it's sort of a variety show with artists and musicians. And I went on there once, and I was promoting a book uh, about surf. It was a surfing memoir called Kook, and I, was, I, I followed like four um, surf bands from California, Hawaii. If you ever want to like promote serious literature to an, you know, sort of a credulous public, don't follow for um, surf bands. It's not really fair. <laughs> it's a driving. Nobody wanted to listen to me. Uh, but uh, Jim goes on this show, and this is what happens to Jim. And it's from a chapter where the painting is called In Hostile Country, Oil on Canvas, 20 by 24 inches. Once an interviewer on a radio show right on the dock in San Francisco asked me why, coming from a family of Jippo loggers in Oregon, I had decided to paint. He was sitting on a stool beside me, and we were beneath a large window that looked from the Embarcadero out onto San Francisco Bay. I used to get drunk before interviews like this, but this was 8 a.m., a little too early even for me. The interviews tended to make me feel like a rabbit or a lamb caught above tree line at nightfall. Steve, who had just become my most important dealer and sort of my manager, swore he would cut me off and send my paintings back if I ever got drunk again on live radio or TV. So I was stone cold sober, except for a one hitter I did openly in the green room with a window looking out to Alcatraz, and I shivered and tried not to follow the progress of a small white sailboat and a big white ferry moving obliquely toward each other on the choppy blue water what a cool place to have a radio interview, right on the dock. And I tried to think seriously about the man's question. He was a good interviewer, warm and really interested, and he seemed to have actually read some of the coffee table book about me that I was now promoting. He must have looked carefully at the images of my work on the gallery's website. I could tell by his questions. But this question stopped my wildly beating heart for a moment and stiffened my bristles and raised hackles I suddenly discovered I had. Maybe I wasn't a rabbit after all. If I was a little stone before, I was not stone now. I blinked. I turned from the imminent and beautiful sea tragedy that was unfolding out the big window and stared at the man. What did you ask? Why does the son of a simple logger paint? Yes, he said, smiling. Why choose to be an outsider artist with all the vagaries of a fickle art market, the stormy uncertainties of creativity? I mean, it's practically asking to be poor, at least for a decade or two in the best case, isn't it? And your family can't have much money to help. I read that you grew up in a trailer in the woods. Why choose art when you might have a decent and rugged living as a logger like your father? I stared at him and thought about my father who died on a 40-degree slope under five tons of dug fur when a choke cable snapped. 
For some reason then, I thought about his red Jean's red chainsaw, which had a 36-inch bar, how he had set it down, still running on a big stump, and turned to lift a canteen filled with tap water when he died. What his buddy Egger told me as he handed me the saw, I sharpened it, he said. I thought about that. All Egger could say after sketching the scene was, I sharpened the chain. I think a lot of our listeners would like to know, the interviewer was saying, it seems terribly brave or reckless. I mean, where you came from, your father was practically illiterate. That, I could tell, was the question of the day. Was it reckless for the son of a Jippo logger to aspire to be an artist? It was the recklessness that informed this visceral, muscular, exuberant, outsider art. How he described it in the intro, I got it, how the art world worked. It was okay to be an outsider as long as you carried your spear and wore your loincloth, stay primitive. Don't get any uppity ideas. He widened his smile until it was pressing against his cheeks. I looked at him. I knew he would never ask the same question of a RISD grad. I had spent nights in jail because of men like this, men who condescended, who impugned, getting in fights. I had paid fines, been on probation. I said, is this show live? It is, right? Now it was his turn to blink. He didn't understand. I could see it, but he held his smile. Yes, of course. That's why we call it West Coast Live. Ha! Huh. A flash of fear appeared in his eyes, there and gone like the flank of a trout catching sunlight. Okay, I nodded in some kind of complicit agreement. I stuck out my hand like for a handshake. He hesitated. He seemed relieved. Okay, a handshake, he said. Let's shake on it. To the recklessness of the artist who is truly down out of the hills and to the recklessness of live radio. He held out his long, slender hand, and I took it warmly like the fish that it was and gripped it the way you grip a big brown to get the hook out, and then I squeezed. He chirped like a chipmunk, then groaned. I squeezed. He pulled away, then tugged, then he was half laughing, half crying. Ow! Okay, okay, uncle. Then he was kind of rearing back out of his stool, and then he was howling, and then I felt a bone snap one of the knuckles in the first joint, and he screamed an unbridled, uncensored, live radio shriek. And in his panic, he had knocked over the stool, and two sound men, or whatever they were, stout guys in baggy jeans, shot across the floor and smothered me. They pulled me off and just half ushered, half shoved me out the double doors that led onto the bright atrium gallery and the wide steps. Nobody followed. No cops, nothing. I stood at the top of the steps with the blood pounding in my temples and looked down at the bustling crowd milling through the indoor market, the coffee shops, bookstores, and restaurants and felt the sun through the skylight warm on my shoulders and let the anger wash through me like warmed oil, a fine skim of anger on every working part until I didn't feel it at all, except that I moved smoother, cleaner than I had in weeks. I felt as if the ghost of my father were standing next to me, and he was laughing. Pop, I said out loud, fuck the fuckers. Let's go get drunk. And I bounded down the steps. Um, so I just, just want to add really quickly that um, I read that in, the, um, in New York. I, I did my first reading at the Strand on the, on the tour. My four little nieces were in the front row, and eight to like, 14, and my editor emailed me the next day. She said, my favorite part of the whole thing was watching little Cammie's face when you said, fuck the fuckers. She, like, she went, like, it was full of glee and, like, disbelief. And, like, Uncle Ting said, fuck it, or fuckers. And then she looked at her, her cousins and her sister, and they, the whole, it was like a church pew moment. They all looked at each other, and it was, they were about to erupt in laughter in this, like, venerable room at the Strand. <laughs> and then the oldest one kind of went like that, and shut him down. So uh, anyway, glad you guys didn't seem to be too ruffled. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Ron Rash is the author of the 2009 Penn Faulkner finalist and New York Times bestselling novel, Serena, in addition to four other prize-winning novels, The Cove, One Foot in Eden, Saints at the River and The World Made Straight. Also four collections of poems and five collections of short stories. His most recent book is Something Rich and Strange, strange Selected Stories. Um, it says here, 
No one captures the complexities of Appalachia, a rugged, brutal landscape of exquisite beauty, as evocatively and indelibly as, as Ron Rash does, and I believe that to be true. Um, let's welcome Ron Rash. It's good to be here. Uh, I left, it was under 10 degrees in Western North Carolina, so uh, you know, it's uh, quite a different feel. I, this book, uh, my, my book, uh, Something Old, Something New in a way, it's uh, rich, Something Rich and Strange, it's 34 short stories. It's, I, I started writing short stories in my early to mid-twenties, and some of the stories are from that period, when, from that time I was, I think the first one I was 24 when I wrote it. So I've got three very early ones in there, and, and a few new ones, uh, much more recent. But uh, it's, it's, it's probably, of all the books I've written, the one I'm most proud of. Uh, I love the short story form. I think having written novels and poems, it is the most difficult, but it's also in many ways the most wondrous when it's done well. You know, you read an Alice Monroe story or a William Trevor story or go back to Chekhov and O'Connor, Welty. Uh, just this amazing thing where you bring the intensity of language, uh, the, the, the feeling of every sentence counting of a poem, every word, and yet the reader leaves a short story, the really good short story, not wishing for anything more. Uh, and, and very often it's almost as if you've given the reader this one moment where everything this person will, has been and will be is crystallized. And that's, to me, the magic of the form. And I called the, the collection something rich and strange. Uh, that's a line from The Tempest by Shakespeare. And if you know that, that play, and I love that play, in a sense that was... Uh, Shakespeare's farewell to the theater. Uh, there's a scene very early on when you have this mystical creature, Ariel, um, speaking uh, full fi fathom five, thy father lies. And she's telling this young man his father has disappeared into the ocean and drowned, but in a sense not died, but uh, undergone a sea change into something rich and strange. And uh, it just struck me that uh, over the years reading that, that, that in a sense is what uh, literature does at its best. It, it can very often take really sad, tragic events and somehow through the art uh, present them in a way into the sublime to where uh, something, even something very dark becomes rich and strange. And so that's um, you know what I've attempted to do in this book and I thought I would read just uh, a brief part of the, the story, the title story, rich, Something Rich and Strange, which is a, a rather mystical story. Uh, I will not be, have the time to read all of it, but uh, I did want to at least read the opening. She follows the river's edge downstream, leaving behind her parents and younger brother who still eat their picnic lunch. It is Easter break and her father has taken time off from his job. They have followed the Appalachian Mountains south, stopping first in Gatlinburg, then the Smokies, and finally this river. She finds a place above a falls where the water looks shallow and slow. The river is a boundary between Georgia and South Carolina, and she wants to wade into the middle and place one foot in Georgia and one in South Carolina so she can tell her friends back in Nebraska she has been in two states at the same time. She kicks off her sandals and enters, the water so much colder than she imagined, quickly deeper, up to her kneecaps, the current surging under the smooth surface. She shivers. On the far shore, a granite cliff casts this section of river into shadow. She glances back to where her parents and brothers sit on the blanket. It is warmer there, the sun full upon them. She thinks about going back, but is almost halfway now. She takes a step and the water rises higher on her knees. Four more steps, she tells herself. Just four more and I'll turn back. She takes another step and the bottom is no longer there and she's being shoved downstream and she does not panic because she has passed all her Red Cross courses. The water shallows and her face breaks the surface and she breathes deep. She tries to turn her body so she won't hit her head on a rock and for the first time she's afraid and she's suddenly back underwater and hears the rush of water against her ears. 
She tries to hold her breath, but her knee smashes against a boulder, and she gasps in pain, and water pours into her mouth. Then for a few moments, the water pools and slows. She rises, coughing up water, gasping air, her feet dragging the bottom like an anchor, trying to snag waterlogged wood or rock jut. And as the current quickens again, she sees her family running along the shore, and she knows they're shouting her name, though she cannot hear them. And as the current turns her, she hears the falls and knows there's nothing that will keep her from it. As the current quickens and quickens and another rock smashes against her knee, but she hardly feels it as she snatches another breath. And she feels the river fall and she falls with it as water whitens around her. And she falls deep into the whiteness and as she rises, her head scrapes against a rock ceiling. And the water holds her there and she tells herself, don't breathe, but the need rises inside her beginning in the upper stomach, then up through her chest and throat. And as that need reaches her mouth, her mouth and nose open and the lungs explode in pain. And then the pain is gone as bright colors shatter around her like glass shards. And she remembers her sixth grade science class, the gurgle of the aquarium at the back of the room the smell of chalk dust that morning, the teacher held a prism out the window so it might fill with color. And she has a final beautiful thought that she is now inside that prism and knows something even the teacher does not know, that the prism's colors are voices, voices that swirl around her head like a crown. And at that moment, her arms and legs, she did not even know were flailing cease, and she becomes part of the river. Thank you. Garth Stein is the author of the New York Times bestselling novel, The Art of Racing in the Rain. Now, I do appreciate uh, an author with a, with a knack for titles. Published in 35 languages, he is also the author of two previous novels, How Evan Broke His Head, and Other Secrets, and Raven Stole the Moon. Stein's last novel is A Sudden Light, which is the story of, well, I'll let Garth tell you. Garth? Before we get, thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. Uh, before we get started, I have one thing I have to do, hold on. Y'all are going to be on Facebook later on tonight. Um, uh, thanks so much for having me out. Uh, this is very exciting um, uh, for a lot of reasons, but mostly because I'm already seeing all these similarities. My, my book has to deal with the uh, timber family, but not the logger side, the timber baron side. So uh, in the Northwest, so we've got some of that in there. And of course, one of my uh, main characters is named Serena. Uh, so I have that in common with you, and I have to find out what I have in, in common with you. Um, let me just, uh, I, I'm not going to read a whole lot, I just want to give you kind of a background on the story, and uh, I, the best way to start, I think, is to read the first paragraph from the, the prologue, uh, The Curse. Growing up in rural Connecticut, I had been told the name Riddell meant something to people in the Northwest. My paternal great-great-grandfather was someone of significance, my mother explained to me. Elijah Riddell had accumulated a tremendous fortune in the timber industry, a fortune that was later lost by those who succeeded him. My forefathers had literally changed the face of America with axes and two-man saws and diesel donkeys to buck the fallen, with mills to pulp, pulp the corpses and scatter the ashes. They carved out a place in history for us all, and that place, I was told, was cursed. So the protagonist of our story is uh, Trevor Riddell. He's the youngest in the long line of the Riddell family. Uh, the way the book sets up is through a lens, so it's being told by a, an adult, Trevor, telling a story to his, his children um, on the location of the North Estate, which was this great uh, uh, estate owned by Elijah, started by Elijah Riddell. And he's, uh, he's telling the story of what happened to him when he was 14 years old, and he first was brought um, to the North Estate by his father, Jones Riddell. And so to really put you in mind of this, I need to ask you, we have to do like a visualization sort of thing. So I'm going to try and, everybody kind of close your eyes or, and meditate here, and I'm going to try and put you into the mood of, of, uh, of 
Trevor Riddell, keeping in mind that it's in 1990 is when the bulk of the story takes place, so it's pre-digital age. So you're a 14 year old boy, you're actually a really bright only child, and you live on this wonderful little farmland in Connecticut. It's got a little field out in front of it, it's got a little creek on the far side, and it's a nice life, you like it. Um, your father is a very strange and remote man, he, he doesn't talk about his past at all. Uh, he, he builds wooden boats for a living in the old traditional wooden boat building fashion, and so it's very painstaking and not highly lucrative. Uh, he's never told you anything about his family history. Your mother, you love your mother very much. She's very bright. She has a PhD in comparative literature from Harvard University, originally from England, and she reads constantly. All she does is read. She doesn't teach. She doesn't do anything with her brilliance except read and read and read, and books are everywhere in your farmhouse. She makes you read, too. At 14 years old, you're incredibly well-read. And then the bottom falls out of your idyllic life. Your father's business goes bankrupt. They have to declare, uh, they have to declare bankruptcy, personal bankruptcy. And, and then the strain of this financial issue uh, drives your parents apart. They separate. Your mother goes back to England to be with her family for the summer. And your father takes you to his, where he's from in Seattle, just north of Seattle, uh, for the summer to meet your aunt, Serena and your grandfather, who you've never met before. So you fly there, you get to Seattle, you drive through the city, you get to the north end, and then you go down some narrow roads, and then there's a, a guard shack with a gate. Imagine that. Your father grew up in a gated community you never knew. You go down these long, winding paths, and it's very lush and green, trees everywhere. You can't even see the houses, they're, but the what glimpses you catch, they're major, they're big houses. And you get to the end of the road, and there's, in front of you is a gigantic meadow. And to the right is uh, Puget Sound, sparkling in the sunlight in July, and then Kitsap Peninsula, and beyond that, the Olympic Mountains. If you know Seattle, you know the Olympic Mountains are all there to the west. And then you look to the left, and on the other side of that meadow is a gigantic house, a mansion of huge proportions. It uh, must have 50 bedrooms. It's, it's, what's amazing about it is it's three stories high, but it's built entirely out of in whole trees as pillars holding up the roof of this, and with bark still on them, these gigantic trees. It's, a temple, it's truly a temple to timber. So you go down all the way to the house, and you get to the house, and you go inside, and it's like going into a museum. It's a, it's a time capsule. It smells of must, and there's a faded uh, oriental rugs all over the floors, and there's grandfather clock that isn't tick-tocking. And in the parlor to your right, there's an eight-foot-tall painting of this, this guy, this old man with long white hair, and he's holding a cane, and he's reaching out of the painting as if he's going to pull you into the painting with him. Your father comes up behind you and says, that's your great-great-grandfather, Elijah Riddell. He built this house. So you go back into the kitchen, this massive kitchen that's in this old crumbling house. You go back there, and you meet your Aunt Serena for the first time. And when you, you, you learned you were going to meet your aunt, you thought, oh, I'm going to meet Mrs. Doubtfire. You know, oh, oh take care of you now, kind of dowdy old lady. In fact, she's 35 years old and she's smoking hot. And she's wearing this very seductive sort of dress and she speaks with a weird affectation like she's out of a Tennessee Williams play. And she never really gives you an answer to any questions that you have. And she has, she walks around barefoot constantly and her toenails are painted this mesmerizing color of blue that you just can't seem to take your eyes off of. You can imagine how this can mess with your 14-year-old mind. And then you meet your grandpa, Grandpa Samuel, looks remarkably like the guy in the painting. He's an old guy. He's wearing all black clothes, and he's sitting out on the front porch being baked by the sun and drinking rosemary lemonade. And he's on his shirt. There are some words on his shirt. So you read the words. You look closely. It's, they're kind of small, and they say, his shirt says, God was my co-pilot, but then we crashed in the mountains, and I had to eat him. What on earth? This is, you're so baffled by all of this. And so you say to him, that's very funny. That's, and he says, what's funny? And you say, you're sure, that's, that's kind of funny. And he looks at it and he says, Serena dresses me. He doesn't know what's on his own shirt. And so, so Serena, it's just his whole weird world. And, and, and as you start to live in this house, now remember, it's 1990. You don't have an Xbox. You don't have satellite. You don't have the internet, none of that stuff. And you're in this house, and it's just the four of you. And it's very far away from the rest of the world, it seems like. You're very isolated. Your father is reticent at best. He's got some baggage that you don't know about, and he won't tell you anything about it. Your, your grandfather may or may not have dementia. Serena keeps saying he has Alzheimer's, but it's not quite clear. Does he or not? And your father, uh, uh, and then Serena herself, dealing with her, is, uh, she's an enigma. Everything's a match. Everything's a battle. She, she goes nine different directions at the same time, so you can't get the truth out of her. But the more you start to explore the house, the more you realize that maybe there is someone else there. You know, these houses in the old days, they were built with uh, 
servant stairways. They were built with secret doors so the servants could deliver the tea at the proper time and not be seen. Servants weren't supposed to be seen in those days when it was built around the turn of the 20th century. And so there are all sorts of crazy things that you can find. And maybe you find uh, some letters from one relative to another. Or maybe you find a diary. And maybe you find some other secret things in this. And you start to put a story together. And then you start listening to the whisperings in the house. And you realize there may be somebody else there, but not maybe, maybe not a person. Maybe there is actually a spirit of the house, as your father and Aunt Serena have suggested. I want to read this one little passage here that gives you an introduction. 